in networking. Now, you've heard me talk a lot about SD-WAN if you've been following me on the Packet Pushers podcast, and if you haven't, you probably should be. And one of the things that I'm beginning to become more and more convinced about is that the carriers are seriously threatened. It's not just the router vendors, it's particularly Cisco and its enterprise unit, which sells $4 billion worth of routers per quarter, but also the carriers themselves, who are a much bigger market, who are decidedly under threat. Right? I was reading some research recently which indicated that private MPLS revenue has already flattened in 2017 and is expected to decline over the next few years, probably 5% per annum going forward. And if you work for telco and 30, 40, 50% of your revenue, in fact, the vast majority of their profits come from private MPLS, you're probably in deep doo-doo. Um, as you face down the fact that your core revenue, your core profit center, is actually worth um, getting, earning less profits and less revenue and shifting away to what I can now call the public web. So I used to call the internet the internet, now I just think of it as a public WAN. I think that's important to talk about because most people don't see the public WAN for what it is. That is, it's, an, it's literally a wide area network that everybody can connect to, a public WAN. In the same way, unlike a public cloud though, it's not owned by just a few people. There's a big difference between the public cloud that AWS has because it's not public. It's actually owned by one company. It's actually a private cloud. But anyway, story for another day. So the fact that we can connect to a public WAN and everybody's connected to it actually creates this thing called a network effect. The more people that are connected to the internet, the more connectivity you can get. So if you think about today when you buy a private WAN service and it takes three months for your carrier to pull a finger out of their proverbial and provision a service, even on an existing cable, or you could connect to the internet and then form a VPN. And many of us are already doing VPN simply because we can get them configured rapidly and on in just a few days. And what we really needed was a technology that could sort of formalize that structurally so we could just throw our private WANs away completely. Carriers depend on these multi, uh, this functionality. They've been building multi-service networks for the past 10 years built on MPLS. And the whole reason they bought in MPLS was so that they could put uh, this idea of private WAN and public WAN and various services on top of the one set of bandwidth. Now, SD-WAN disrupts this and the router vendors as well as the, as the carriers. Uh, it does that by replacing it at the edge. So instead of you caring about whether the private WAN is better than the public WAN, um, you don't actually care because you might use an SD-WAN edge device and connect over some private bandwidth, connect over some public bandwidth. Um, I've been speaking with people who are actually finding that the 4G network outperforms the cable network, outperforms the private WAN. So literally, for any given piece of connectivity, they're having much more success uh, on their 4G network than they are with their you know, 100 meg DSL connections, which I find staggering. But you know, a lot of these SD-WAN devices are so intelligent at the edge that they can actually detect uh, the performance of the network that's actually going through and watch the applications and if this connection is the fastest, the least latency, the best performance, then they'll just select that. And that's a whole radical change in the way that we work, right? Now, of course, that's bad for router vendors because if you're making um, a router, like, for example, the Cisco's ISI router, which everybody's familiar with, it can barely even use one circuit, much less two at the same time, and yet most SD-WAN pro products can do three or four circuits at the same time pretty easily. And your average Cisco ISI router is barely capable of classifying packets by access list and um, or any much less doing deep packet inspection like Cisco's refused to put deep packet inspection engine into their router code and yet there's now 25 um, SD-WAN companies who've done exactly that in less than two or three years. This is a baffling thing. Right? Why didn't Cisco um, do this years and years ago and we wouldn't be in this situation? A little voice in the back of my head going, uh, because they don't want to upset the carriers, right? Because the carriers need to sell private WANs, and guess who sells the routers that builds those MPLS backbones on those private WANs? The same companies, Cisco, Juniper, and so forth, right? So it's not in their interest to invest SD-WAN, and the carriers have been well protected by the companies that sell them the products. It's been a, a, a circle that the router vendors make money selling the carrier's stuff, so the carriers can have their market protected, so there's not too much innovation from the router vendors to undermine what you're doing. And so the customers lose in the end. And we all know that when it comes to carriers, customers always lose. Keep in mind that when we build our own networks, our own MPLS connections, what do we do? We build them with a single carrier. Why? Because using two carriers is almost impossibly difficult. Not completely. There are companies who do run 
um, SD1, uh, run MPLS overlays over the top of other carriers' networks and have multiple. But that became impossibly difficult. MPLS is not simple. Our router vendors have charged a very large licensing fees to use their MPLS code and their BGP code. Running a two-carrier network was impossible, so most of us locked down to one. They, of course, responded anti-competitively by locking you into five-year agreements, because if you were only going to choose one or the other, they might as well lock you in for five to ten-year supply agreements, because that's a cheap way to sell products. Keep in mind that a five-year agreement is a very cheap sale. Once every five years you do a sale, then you walk away and you come back five years later and you resell. Lowers the cost, maximizes profits. Good for carriers, not so good for you as a customer, I think. Think about also with modern routers why they're so sucky, and that's because if I wanted to get, say, say I wanted to have a 100 meg primary and a 10 meg backup, I can't actually load balance some of the traffic across both of those, evenly or unevenly. There's no practical method to do that today, especially not in the widespread market. And there's also a problem around, um, even if I had 200 meg circuits, the today's routing protocols won't let me load balance across the two effectively. Very, very difficult to do, to the point where most of us just use an active standby. So this is where SD-WAN comes in, a backdrop of uh, private MPLS, variegated services, high prices, poor quality service from carriers because they've got no incentive. You can't arbitrage, you can't change them, you get locked into five-year contracts. The router vendors are very happy selling these dumb routing devices at the edge, charging you premium prices for them. And the carriers um, feel comfortable knowing that their core product isn't going to be disrupted because they also buy the routers from the same vendors and those vendors have a vested interest in maintaining the carrier dominance. And that is where we are today. That doesn't sound too good. So in part one, I had to get a new beer. I spent uh, most of the first session writing out the first beer, writing out the notes and getting that called. And then I was sitting there thinking about it. The question is, if software-defined WAN does all these things to the carriers, if it breaks them, if it makes them broken, makes their business models broken, they're going to have to respond to that. Um, and that's exactly what we're seeing. We're starting to see uh, all of the carriers around the world uh, turn themselves into managed service providers as they start to... Um, rent products from the SD-WAN. So when the first generation of SD-WAN vendors reached the market, they were selling their products to the enterprises directly. And that takes time. It's a fairly slow sort of a sell. So we saw a lot of um, SD-WAN vendors start talking to the carriers, even though that's also a difficult sell because the, uh, the carriers take years to make decisions and years to roll out new services. And that's a risky sell because you could spend years and years with a sales team working around a carrier Big reward if you can win it, but risky if you don't. What um, SD-WAN does for you as a customer is it allows you to arbitrage the carriers. And arbitrage is a fancy term for have multiple vendors. And what you can do is because you could say, I'm going to have a carrier from a circuit from BT and another one from Telstra and another one from level three and load balance across all three circuits for a given location, like at a branch network, you might use a combination of Comcast or Optus or whoever it is that's got you know, a local internet provider who just happens to be in the area, go and use them as your bandwidth because SD-WAN is very uh, tolerant and very efficient over just just give, use the bandwidth, any bandwidth that's available. And of course that's very damaging to carriers because they rely on selling you premium quality bandwidth because your routers are so dumb. They can't cope with anything that's happening. So SD-WAN allows you to arbitrage the carriers. Now, that is something that carriers do not want. They do not want to lose control of you as the customer. They do not want to lose control of customers who want to go and shop around for the best price. They don't mind if you shop around once every five years because that suits them just fine because everything turns into a mission-critical single one-off. Get the CIO in the room and there's only one person you have to convince. But if you can shop around every day of the week, then all of a sudden the purchasing department can just start to make mincemeat out of you as a carrier, which is pretty bad for them, but great for the customer because now you can compare apples and apples, oranges and oranges. Whether you've got a 100 meg DSL or a 10 meg private WAN, doesn't matter. You just want it to work and work reliably. The second thing about SD-WAN is it lets you use any circuit type. So up until now with private WAN, we've always required the carrier to bring virtually in modern era some sort of wave division multiplexer onto pre on prem or they bring in some sort of tdm legacy 30 year old circuit or some whatever they have to do they have to bring it on site and then you're restricted to using whatever it is that they suits the carrier not what suits you and uh, if you can suddenly start to mix up dsl from any isp or local municipal fiber or 4g 5g or even you know dial-up networks like ISDN, if you could arbitrage any of those things, and those are possible, unlikely, must be said, but possible, then any circuit, any type, any speed, any type of latency, um, 
although latency and speed do have an impact, most of the SD-WAN devices can route around or partially load balance or indistinctly load balance, and this would be part of your buying process. So you could have a 10 meg slow circuit over here and a 100 meg fast and do most of your loading over here, but still use the 10 meg for slow stuff very easily too, by the way. That's all graphically controlled. Another part about this is if you can use any circuit type, as long as it terminates in Ethernet on your SD-WAN box and you put something in front of that, then all of a sudden you don't care about your carrier. Again, its physical network is irrelevant to you. That's the carrier's problem, not you as a customer. So much about me as a customer buying from a carrier comes down to what can they present to me. That's wrong. It should be what they can, you know, how many different ways of presenting that circuit to me can I have, not me making choices based on what the carrier will give me. That's wrong. So there's and fundamental flaws in the market. We've got ourselves kowtowed to the carriers in a lot of strange ways. Now, Using what's available is also very interesting. This idea of moving into a building and if somebody's already provisioned carrier X, but you're normally with carrier Y, so you just go and buy some bandwidth from carrier X and connect to the internet over them, over the public WAN, then boom, you're in action. Do you care? You should not care, right? You really should not care. So what's carriers been doing to react? So carriers obviously need to fight back. They really want to keep control of you as the customer. Mm. This is, uh, by the way, this is milk stout. Uh, I'm very fond of a porter or a dark beer, as you've probably noticed. Uh, this one's actually quite chilled because that's the way it's designed to be serviced, but it's not cold. It's not like um, uh, chilling my tongue, but it's beautifully smooth and slick. Uh, very chocolatey. Very chocolatey. So carriers have been trying to fight back against this. They can see this coming. They've got lots of money. They're full of smart people. Although it's not normally obvious for those of us on the outside that there are smart people in those organizations. One of the, they're very absolutely terrified that you as a customer will start to get control of your, your things. Today, the carrier sees that they have full control of their customers. They own you, in effect. And they can prevent you from... Um, leaving, they can control everything about you. They have statistics on what you can do, how much bandwidth you consume and stuff like that, although they're not easily organized enough to make advantage of it. But they're terrified of losing, losing your control of you and locking you in. If you can start to move outside of the moat that they've built to prevent you from leaving, that means they've lost control and they've lost control of profits and revenue. They're also very concerned about um, capturing more revenue. So if the MPLS, if it add the, the move to the public WAN, is inevitable. Everybody's going there, the cloud providers are there. Um, so you're going to see a lot more of that. Um, you really have to be able to find a way to increase revenue with customers to replace the revenue in the private WAN that's gone. That's just going to disappear. Like if I'm buying an SD-WAN today, I am not going to connect it to a private MPLS because the cost of just deploying private MPLS circuits is going to cr cripple you when you can just go and buy an internet connection with a $50, you know, a trivial connection free, like hundreds of dollars at most. You don't need to wait months for them to bring a fiber onto your premises and, you know, wind up something and do this and be constantly attending site for appointments and uh, just the foolishness of this legacy carrier model just makes me angry every time I start to talk about it. Right? So what the carriers have been building is a network functions virtualization. And this is where they're going to try and convince us that they can run software instances of things like firewalls. They're going to be able to run SD-WAN instances in the, on software, firewalls, and malware engines, IDSs, scanning topologies, any range of proxy servers, any range of services that today you can get in appliance, they want to be able to deliver this as a VM in their POP. So you would have one cable on your premises, run it back, and then in the prop they would have a whole bunch of, of um, VMs that they would allocate to you, and that's where you could go and configure your firewall rules and your scanning engines and things like that. Now NFV is a big deal. The carriers have been working on it like mad for five years. The vendors have been desperately trying to work out how to make this work and capture this market. I don't believe that this will end, uh, in ultimately work. The idea that a carrier, a telco, a, a vast, vast organization that can barely do what it does today, like obviously because those of us who live with them every day, you know, the, your average carrier can barely even provision a circuit. The idea that they're going to be able to use software to do fast, rapid provisioning of firewall rules or manage a portal that you can use, I don't get that. And now I'm talking about any carrier in the world, Telstra, BT, AT&T, Verizon, Deutsche Telekom. They all think they can. And I think they will be able to at small scale, like for limited trial deployments. But when they try and scale this up for countrywide global deployments, 
with millions of tail circuits and hundreds of thousands of customers like you know SMB and SME as well as global enterprises. Can you imagine your average telco offering you a firewall service that actually makes sense and whether they could keep that running and whether they could give you, and even if they did, what sort of service guarantee could they give you? That's ridiculous. Like just saying that out loud makes you sort of go like, no, that's not going to happen. Are you, they're going to think they can. And I bet they're throwing billions of dollars into this pit. And we've seen that, you know, the, uh, this week alone, AT and T bought Viata, the remembrance of Viata from Brocade, so that they could, you know, pursue this NFV path. I believe that they're going to give it a go, but I truly don't believe that they'll ever make it happen because. Your average carrier's real business, the true business of a carrier, is actually owning cable in the ground. It's a bit like mining. That's like asking a mining company to start making smartphones because that's consuming the materials that they dug out of the ground. The gap between having bandwidth and turning it into something useful is just so unimaginably vast, there's no way you can build a vertically integrated business model out of it. Carriers are also having a tough time because they're about to roll out 5G. So we saw 3G going in. We've had massive transitions to 4G, which gave them the ability to sell more smartphones, more pa you know, uh, more connections, more bandwidth. And the next generation of 5G is just around the corner, and they're just gearing up now to spend many billions of dollars rolling that. Every country in the world is going to need to deploy 5G. And these telcos, at the same time as they're re-engineering these private WANs, or so-called private WANs that they're going to do and add all these services to you, are going to have a certain amount of their executive attention focused on these build-outs of these 5G networks. So again, a carrier who can barely even run a cable into your site to give you a 10 meg Ethernet service today is now going to be managing a multi-billion dollar rollout of 5G services you know, right across its entire estate as well as re-engineering everything to use software-defined networking and run NFV for customized per-user services. That, that doesn't compute either. I mean, to me, that it's possible, right? Anything is possible, but you've got to be saying that they're just going to be pouring money down the drain, and really they should be focusing on doing what the smart money should be doing is just build bandwidth. Um, now, a number of carriers have, of course, thought that getting into managed service providers would be the right thing to do. That is... Instead of relying on managed, so today, managed service providers are basically people who bulk buy bandwidth and then add value to it. They'll go and buy 10 you know, MPLS circuits from the big carriers and then subdivide it and trunk it for you or do the configuration of the routers. They basically do the customization work that your average telco can't. So they're looking at these MSPs and saying, you know, we should set up our own, we should boost our MSP division to something much larger. And of course, they're... <laughs> You can imagine how that's going. And they're going to be on your doorstep, banging down your door saying, MSPs, we've got to be able to, you know, we've got a new MSP, new products, bills around SD WAN, and you've got to be willing to, to buy into that. I, I think it's foolish if you do. I understand that you may not, many people won't have an understanding that the market has transitioned and you can now arbitrage your MPLS providers and just turn them into internet providers. And instead of having you know, one provider for your internet, you're going to have five. And I've got other articles that I've published around how to build an SD-WAN internet connection and so forth. But the concept that MSPs, that big carriers, or any telco could run a managed service provider effectively, like, and actually focus on the customer without focusing on its internal needs first, again, highly, highly dubious. The basic points I'm trying to make here is that carriers can't do customer service. They work at such large scale and their real business is actually digging cable into the ground and attaching electronics to the back of it to make bandwidth. They should just focus on making bandwidth. They should sell it at the cheapest possible price and they should give it to us for that. They should be like electricity. You can have electricity, it's bulk rated, it's volume. Carriers do not want that because that is a low profit, low growth, that's a stultified market. But the reason that I'm dubious is I don't believe that you can be an electricity company that's selling services. There was a trend about 10 years ago that your electricity company would be able to be the right company to talk to about selling washing machines and white goods for the house and air conditioning units. And we've all seen how that worked out. And that's exactly what will happen to the carriers. I mean, you have to say from the lessons we've seen where any sort of business that's in the bulk band just dies. Um, st single supplier as a customer is still a broken business model. You must be able to arbitrage. You must be able to have two carriers or multiple sources of supply and play them off against each other. You must be able to have 
three or four carriers bidding for your business constantly month in month out if you can't do that you are then going to be in the control under control by the supplier so signing a single supplier agreement with anyone is bad for your business as a customer you're just giving them revenue and they can charge whatever they like and at every price and give you any service because you're locked into that single supplier and we've seen that with router companies and networking companies people who've been locked into a single supplier of one port or another have always suffered and ultimately end up being trapped there that also requires you as a customer to be smart and unfortunately most of you aren't smart that's it then finally do not underestimate and this is possibly my biggest point and maybe I should have put this up front but do not underestimate the fact that just how many customers hate their carriers how many network engineers despise these people who have made their lives miserable decade in, decade out? And how many CIOs would much rather make lives miserable for the carriers? And if they have a chance to make decisions that take it in a direction that suits them instead of the carriers, I think many will do so with great delight, regardless of the impacts one way or the other. I'm Greg Farrow. I'm the co-host of the Packet Pushers podcast. You can find more like this at my blogs at packetpushers.net. You can follow me on the Twitter as at Ethereal Mime. I hope you've enjoyed uh, Two Beer Networking today, talking about carriers and SD-WAN. Mm. I'm going to uh, copy this to my computer and start editing it, so hopefully by the time I finish this just delicious milk stout beer, and I'll look forward to catching you again uh, when I publish the next Two Beer Networking. Thanks. Oh, don't forget to like and subscribe and all that YouTube stuff. Uh, buttons, whatever.